Hello, today's lecture is on the stock market, what you need to know. We already know that the stock market is simply a place where buyers and sellers of stocks come together. Remember that a stock is a claim on ownership. When you buy a stock, you're buying a portion of the company. The difference is that when you buy a bond, you are by, you're simply lending a company or the government money. The bond itself is a promise to repay. Now keep in mind both of these um, are sold on stock exchanges. All right, let's get some background for our stock exchange. We know that there have always, well, not always, but since the 1600s, we've had stock exchanges. In the United States, the first real stock market was the Bank of North America, who in 1784 helped the Continental Congress to reissue bonds. During the American Revolution, Continental Congress sold about $80 million worth of bonds to finance the Revolutionary War. The problem was that come um, the t due date to repay those bonds, the U.S. government had no ability to tax us and thus had real need, no ability to get the money it needed to repay the bonds. So what it did is it went to the Bank of North America and said, hey, sell more bonds so we can get money to repay the first bonds. All right something the government has been doing uh, ever since. Today, there are over 14 different stock exchanges in the United States. The two biggest, the New York Exchange and the American Exchange, are located on Wall Street. The third largest is the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Now, steps that you need to take in order to buy a stock. Now, whether you do this <coughs> online, or whether you do this face-to-face -face with a broker, you're doing basically the same thing. The first thing you need to do is contact the broker. When you contact your broker, make sure you know what you wanna buy, how much you wanna spend, whatever particulars you need, all right? Because you will then give that information to the broker. The broker will then in turn call their floor trader. That's the person who um, works for the broker or the company the broker works for, um, and they're actually on the floor of the exchange. Now, the broker will then find the specialist. The specialist is a broker who buys and sells stocks for other brokers. They tend to specialize in six to 10, maybe six to 15 different stocks, usually in the same industry. And so your floor trader, if you want to buy a stock, will go to the specialist and ask for the ask price of a stock. The ask price is the price at which the specialist is willing to sell a stock. If you wanted to buy, they would ask for the bid price of the stock. Floor traders and specialists will now begin to negotiate a price. Now, negotiating is... A nice way of putting it. Sometimes, you know, all the yelling and screaming that you hear on the floor of the exchange, that's the negotiation. So basically what happens is your floor trader goes up to the specialist and says, I want to buy company ABC. <clears throat> what is your ask price? Now your floor trader knows they can only spend, say, $100 a share. Specialist says the ask price of ABC is now $120. You can't afford that. Your floor trader can't spend that. So they counter. Hey, we'll give you $90 a share. And so here's the negotiating process. They dicker back and forth, hopefully come up with a price that your floor trader can purchase the stock for you. At any point during this quote unquote negotiations, you will, uh, someone from 
the area, you know, somebody's walking by can say, hey, I want to buy that too. Now, if there are two people who want to buy the stock and only one person wanting to sell, what's going to happen? Well, the price of the stock's going to get bid up. There are two people wanting it and not enough people wanting to sell. On the other hand, if somebody walks by and says, hey, I've got ABC stock, I want to sell it. There are now two people, the specialist and the person who walked by, who are wanting to sell the stock. They're going to now bid the price down. Two people want to sell, one person wants to buy, the price of the stock drops. Uh, this negotiating process will continue until a price is agreed upon. At that point, you own your stock. Now, why have stock prices been tumbling the last couple of weeks? Well, partially it's out of fear. Brokers want to liquidate their funds. They want to get cash. Owning a stock ties up your money. <clears throat> it is not really the most liquid of assets. So in times of fear, people want to hold cash. So that's what we're seeing happening these days is that brokers are selling stocks in order to get cash. They're afraid to keep their money tied up. The stock market is really the barometer of how investors feel about not only the health of the companies they're buying and selling, but also the health of the economy. Investors do not like uncertainty. And that's one of the things that we are definitely seeing now is a lot of uncertainty. So it's not surprising that the stock market keeps dipping, happening in the market. Trying to figure out what's going on in the stock market, even on a slow day, is kind of difficult. We have to realize that there are 2,800 2, stocks or companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So how can we understand what's going on at any given moment? Well, we have to use an index. An index is simply a smaller number of stocks. The most well-known index is the Dow Jones Composite Index. The Dow is made up of 65 selected stocks. And those 65 are broken up into the following three categories. The Dow Jones Industrials, which make up 30 stocks. Examples of those are 3M, Intel, Merck, Pfizer, ExxonMobil. And the industrials, <clears throat> excuse me, are industries or companies from across the economy. Uh, the idea is if we pick some of the big boys, the big companies, we can then uh, get a better representation of what's happening in the economy as a whole. The next section of the Dow Jones composite is the Dow Jones Transportations. The Dow Jones Transportations are made up of 20 stocks that represent the transportation industry. These are airlines, trucking companies, um, railroads, things like that. All right, they are separated out because of their importance in moving commodities. Finally, the last member of the Dow Jones composite are the Dow Jones utilities. These are 15 utility stocks representing things, energy companies um, of all sorts, the American Water Company, uh, Consolidated Edison, uh, First Energy Corp, things like that. So that the movement of these 65 stocks is a sampling of what's going on in the market. For those of you who took statistics, you know if you take a sample of the population, 
that can represent the whole population. And that's what we're doing here with the Dow Jones composite is trying to take a sample of the most important stocks in our economy, the most important industries in our economy. And now trading on the margin is simply buying stock on credit. Today, the way this works, you have to put 55% of your value down in cash and 45 down with some collateral. Now, in 1929, uh, that was different. You only had to put 50% of the value, or excuse me, 30% of the value down in cash. Now, let's see how this created an issue. Let's say you wanted to buy $100 worth of stock. All you had to do was put $30 down in cash, $70 down in collateral. Hey, put the pink slip for your car down. You know, your car's worth 70 bucks. Now, in 1929, what you could do was then take that $100 worth of stock, add $42 to it, and now you could buy on the margin $142 worth of stock. Well, that's great, right? <clears throat> Let's keep going. You could then take that $142 worth of stock, use it as your collateral, add $60 to it, and get $202 worth of stock. We keep going. Take your $202 worth of stock, add $86 to it. You could buy $288 worth of stock. One more round. Use your $288 worth of stock as collateral add $123 in cash. You buy $411 worth of stock. Now, what does that it allow you to end up with? <clears throat> well, you're only paying out $341 worth of cash, but you're getting back a whopping $1,000. $143 worth of stock. You've just almost, you've more than tripled your, price, your, your net worth. And this is what happened in 1929. A lot of people used buying on the margin, trading on the margin as a way of, at least on paper, their net worth was very large. But a lot of it was done on the margin. And so they owed a lot of money. But people didn't know. If you were a banker, you didn't know that someone bought their stocks on the margin. You thought they had, they owned the stock outright. So you'd give them more credit. And then they'd go buy a big mansion and they go buy cars and they buy all this stuff. Uh, one of the reasons why the Great Depression occurred, uh, according to some economists, was that so many people bought stock on the margin and they couldn't pay off what they owed. Now, why was that a problem? It was a problem. If you look at this chart, what happens if the stock, the first stock that you bought for $100, if the value of that stock dropped to $70, which is what you still owe on it, your broker had the right to call you up and say, you need to pay me my $70 now. In theory, if you didn't, they could sell your collateral. But who wants to waste time trying to sell your car? What they would do instead was sell your stock. And so if you no longer owned that first $100 worth of stock, guess what? The collateral for your second level of stock purchases is now gone. You either had to fork over that $100 or the broker would sell your $140, $142 worth of stock. All right. So can you see how at any point here, if you lose one of your stocks and you've used that stock as collateral for an, to purchase another stock, you had a problem. You were setting off a domino effect in which more and more stocks got sold. And in 1929, this is one of the things that economists look at as the reason for the great stock market crash. 
was that so much stock was purchased on the margin and brokers very quickly began selling, it ended up crashing the market. 